viewers wish you all a very happy holi i don't mean to dampen your spirits but i definitely intend to ring the alarm bell here even on the occasion of festival more importantly on the occasion of this festival what we are looking at as far as the covid situation is concerned is extremely worrying and alarming and yet we don't seem to care we don't care as if corona even exists we are roaming around celebrating festivals attending large scale gatherings not even bothering to wear a mask even as the numbers go up at a staggering pace so tonight we're going to talk about it one more time in case you've not looked at the numbers and the situation let me tell you what's been happening in our country the new cases went up by 51% in just one week If you take a look at the average daily cases in the week of March 15 to 21st and you compare it to the week of March 22nd to 28th it really tells you the picture that's how fast the number of cases are rising case increase has happened four times right now in comparison to February four times than what we were in february experts will repeatedly tell you that the second wave seems to be spreading faster 51% rise in rate of infection within one week it's not just a problem for maharashtra or just mumbai anymore eight states together now are contributing to 84.5% of daily new new cases and these eight states are looking at a staggering daily increase the kind we didn't see when we were in a lockdown obviously the kind we didn't see even in the last festival period or since then and three states that have been worst hit are maharashtra karnataka and punjab and i'll give you one example to begin with and we'll look at the others as we go along If you had to look at a daily case numbers for Maharashtra it recorded 15000 cases on March 15th 23000 cases by March 17th 30500 cases March 21st March 25th we were recording almost 36000 cases and we hit and crossed 40000 and then to 40400 by march 28th those are the numbers that we are looking at similarly punjab that actually in february was just looking at 579 which by punjab standards is still a very very high number that number now has gone to a daily case rise of 2500 2600 2963 is the last 24 hour number that we've got karnataka from 527 on one day in february 28th which again by the way we had said that it is now on the way up and it will become a concern by march 15 that number had gone up to 932 10 days later it was 2523 and now over 3000 cases because i don't think we are realizing which way we are headed and if we believe just because there is vaccination going on right now this is not going to be a problem it is going to be a problem for you and i if we don't pull up our socks right now so let's say good evening to some experts who can help us put this in perspective Dr N K Arora chief director for England chairman of the covid-19 working group joining us right now Rajiv Das Gupta chairman of the center of social medicine and community health joins us this evening Dr Shashank Joshi dean indian college of physicians at Leelawati member of the Maharashtra task force and Dr Talwar chairman of the cardiac sciences PSRI hospital in Delhi also advisor to the Punjab government on medical education and health uh, let me actually first up start off with Dr. N. K. Arora. Dr. Arora, 
we keep saying that we are looking at a faster spread. Now, is that now also in multiple states? Is this still limited to just a couple of states? Or are we looking at a faster spread in, in larger parts of our country? Thank you, Tanvi, for inviting me. <clears throat> the situation is really worrisome. And uh, uh, we are moving at a much faster rate than uh, it was happening last year, even in August and September when we hit the uh, peak around 100,000 uh, somewhere in the middle of September. And uh, if you look at, you put the uh, statistics very nicely and you were telling us how things are moving in various uh, states. So I would, I would break down and come down to a little uh, smaller area. And if you look at uh, the maximum spread is occurring in big cities and metro cities, heavily populated areas where spread is very fast. Be it uh, Maharashtra or in Karnataka, we go to even in Delhi, the spread is taking place and Punjab, as you are mentioning. And uh, to me, it appears uh, three or four very important things. One, that I think the fear which uh, uh, most of us had last year has disappeared. I think most of us think that it's a mild disease. Now with vaccination, I think everything can be taken care of. And we have forgotten all COVID appropriate behavior. And I think that is the crux. There are large social gatherings, religious gatherings, political gatherings, and I think all of these are contributing. One issue which many may think that the contribution is probably because of the mutants and variants, I must say that the, it is not a significant reason for such massive and exponential increase in the numbers. I think it is that laparvai, the callousness of all of us, that we think uh, it's a mild disease and we are not afraid anymore. And that's the key for the rapid spread, particularly in highly dense areas of uh, our country. But if it is just Laparvai, Dr. Arora, why was it that e in this, even in month of January, we didn't see these numbers? By then, we had pretty much opened up. Since festival time, we'd opened up, malls were open, markets were open, public transport had opened, uh, weddings were taking place uh, in January as well. Then how is it that, you know, from mid-Feb to now, and with every passing week, things are just getting worse. Uh, so I, I think uh, when you were saying that the initial opening up, people were still hesitant and there was... So I, I think one of the uh, things which has really turned the tide is when we hit the Nadir somewhere in the first week of February when around 8,000 cases. And in fact, even on this channel, uh, I heard people saying that... The, uh, uh, the corona is gone, just 8,000. The value of vaccine and other things was questioned at that time. And I think that has been uh, probably a reason while we were discussing that viral infection comes in waves. There was peak in September, there was nadir in, uh, in, in February, and again it is rising. And so it has no seasonality, but I think it's the usual viral behavior plus the human behavior which we are seeing across the country, particularly in these heavily populated areas. Okay, uh, Dr. Rajiv Das Gupta, would you agree that this is actually now because people are becoming less and less fearful, more brazen? Maybe there is a thought that, well, vaccine is here, or they think, oh, it's only happening in one part and the other part, and it won't happen to us. Yes, I would fully agree with uh, the view that uh, Dr. Arora uh, said. Uh, to, to add uh, substance to what he said, uh, or to reinforce it, the, the urban factor, so to say, uh, if you see the top five districts in, in both these states, let's say Punjab and Maharashtra, the top five districts in Maharashtra are Pune, Mumbai, Nagpur, Thane, and Nashik. And for Punjab, this is Jalandhar, uh, Mohali, SS Nagar, Ludhiana, Amritsar, and Patiala. So clearly, in, in India, it still continues to be an urban peri-urban phenomenon. The rural India, the rural hinterland, relatively remains unaffected still, but the population certainly remains vulnerable, and therefore no doubt uh, that this continues to be an urban phenomenon. What is also worrying for these states is extremely high 
test positivity rate in Maharashtra, it has hovered around 12, 13%. And, and that's showing up uh, in these cases. And uh, five states, which is Maharashtra, Kerala, Punjab, Karnataka, and Chhattisgarh also, Chhattisgarh to much less extent, is contributing 80% of the active cases in the country. So clearly, the need is to focus attention on these urban areas uh, to, to, to really have uh, tailored containment strategies for each of these towns and cities. It's, it's, it's not even the whole district, but really the urban and peri-urban areas that need attention. And, and this is not new. I mean, last year also, we more or less had this phenomenon. Uh, the challenge now is, at the state level, if you ask these state uh, you know, program managers, they will tell you there's a huge <laughs> challenge of human resources. The, the entire uh, health and non-health staff who were mobilized for, for the COVID activities in the last one year, uh, or at its peak last year, have most, most have now gone back to their, to their own activities, including the health personnel who have gone back to their own non-COVID duties, which are also equally important to to, to uh, maintain and sustain. The second uh, factor is with the vaccination beginning and with so much of emphasis on vaccination, which is rightly so, the health sector human resource is divided between the epidemiological services for test track control, et cetera, and the vaccination services. So in short, the state managers are finding this HR situation extremely tough to manage and there are no easy answers, honestly. Uh, and 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 that is con that will continue to have a bearing on how much we can handle at this stage. Mm. The subtext of which is that it may actually end up spreading faster. Mm. That may just lead to it spreading faster. You have to keep in mind that there are non-COVID, uh, you know, uh, health uh, services that have to be catered to. There's also the vaccination that we're looking at, and now these rising cases. I mean, uh, Dr. Shashank Joshi. We broke Mumbai's highest ever daily case record several days ago. And now we have, what, more than two times on, uh, already? We have 7,000, 8,000 stuff that we didn't even see even cases here in Mumbai were peaking. Now, to your mind, is this what it is? People are just not following rules and that's what's uh, leading to it? No, I, I don't agree uh, uh, with that. I think people are not following COVID inappropriate behavior across the country. So I think there is clearly a contribution of the variant strain, whatever you call it, homegrown or international or whatever it is. There is a faster transmitting virus. So in the past, if in a family, one or two people were getting affected, now the whole cluster of eight or ten people in the family are getting infected. It spreads very fast. Formerly, the incubation period used to be a couple of days, at least five to seven days. Now it's within a day or two. Clinically, we are clearly seeing a very fast spreading strain, but very good recovery, very low case fatality. And because we ramped up our testing aggressively, See, Delhi today tested 68,000 cases. They got around 1,900. Mumbai is testing only 40, 50,000 cases, and they are getting around 6, 7,000 with a TPR, which is very worrisome. But it was 18% two weeks back. Now it is down to around 18, 12 to 14%. So clearly, we are in a grim situation. And but it's a faster spreading virus, and the case fatality rate is pretty low. It's hovering around 0 0.2, 0 0.3. If you see this year's case fatality rate, it has been pretty low. So there's a large amount of a term called case demic, which means there are a lot of cases which are asymptomatic, 80%, and that's where all the problem lies. All the asymptomatic cases are concentrated. They are the spreaders and super spreaders. They are in the younger population. We are clearly seeing a younger population, active population, which is getting the silent disease and is spreading the disease quick and fast. And that is where we need urgent public health strategy. So there is no denial of the fact that we need to get back to COVID appropriate behavior. That is mandatory. And there is absolutely zero tolerance for that. But at the same time, you need to understand that there is clearly a variant which is faster spreading, rapidly transmissible, but low virulence and low case fatality rate. But our only worry is that a double mutant becomes a triple mutant from a genomic standpoint, there will be immune escape. And even our vaccination program may get threatened. So it's important to stem it out. And that is why we are already, our healthcare infrastructure is getting important. The other thing is the demographics have changed. In the last year, we were seeing people in the lower socioeconomic effects, Dharavi getting affected. Now, Dharavi is still reporting single digit, double digit. But we are seeing the middle class and upper middle class getting affected. So all the private hospitals in Mumbai are already full. Of course, the public hospitals still have some space left, but it's rapidly filling up. The rate of rise is clearly worrying, and we need to get our public health measures, particularly micro-containment, ceiling of buildings, as well as contact tracing 1 is to 30, 
aggressively as quickly as possible. Otherwise, we will probably in another couple of weeks may have no other left uh, option left if the whole healthcare infrastructure is burdened. That probably we may need to do a lockdown-like strategy, which we don't want to do. If you ask me, and the other thing is that COVID work, as I would agree with the previous panelists, that people are fatigued, and also the work is divided between non-COVID work and vaccination work. So there are, you know, and the the number of people are so finite. So obviously there is a definitely an overloading of work on the healthcare infrastructure in general, and it can crack at the rapidity and the pace at which this is spreading. So people need to be responsible. I think that is equally important. But I think there is a strain. The only silver lining is the low case fatality rate. The, yes, uh, in in large parts of the country, especially in Maharashtra, that's what we're looking at. The open jobs even looked at a, a significantly high number of deaths as well, Dr. Talwar. Uh, what do we do then? I mean, at this point, I believe for several of the states and the center, the alarm bells need to start ringing. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I think uh, it has been amply emphasized that the COVID protective behavior is one of the actually aspect which we, I hope the public realizes and does it. But as far as uh, I think the Punjab goes, uh, I must say that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, mutation which has occurred, I think we have now more than 85%. We have analyzed about 800 plus samples out of that uh, 85% uh, UK variant. And we all know that the UK variant is uh, highly infectious, 60 to 70% more infectious than the original virus. And of course, uh, it is well known in this disease that crowded places are the where the spread is much more. That's why limited to more cities. This was also in the first wave. If you look at uh, with us in uh, August, September, these were the districts that we were suffering. Now again, but that's because of the crowding of these places. But the, I think mutation which has in the Punjab particularly, because we have the data 85% positive or UK uh, variants. And of course, uh, this is, uh, I mean, um, virulence wise is as virulent as a, the original virus. We have a, uh, as compared to our first wave, our mortality is less. But I think the Punjab has some issues because the question is the people really ignore them in the beginning. It's very difficult to motivate them to come early. They lose the golden time, golden period. And when they come more sicker, and as we know, the 85%, 90% become okay as such. So they say, what is it? Aega, chala jayega. So as a, this is what is the probably the issue. And I think the, I agree that I think because of this uh, a surge which is going on, the surge is more, the number of sick patients will also be more. So yeah. I think we will have to take care of them. And so I, the, the vaccination so, is very vital. So let, let me ask you this question, Dr. Talwar. Did we, did we fail in terms of our surveillance in the last few months as well, when we knew that there were these variants, homegrown or from UK or wherever, which were spreading faster, which were dangerous when we'd seen what had happened in United Kingdom? Did we not do enough surveillance? Suddenly now we are realizing 80% cases are from UK, uh, the UK variant. You see, uh, look, madam, I think Punjabi have been uh, asking for the surveillance data from September onward last year. We have been approaching the organization which were sort of scientifically, which were capable or had the facility to do it. So we have been pursuing with them. And our samples have been sent from November, December, January, February kind of a thing. So I think the state, because we don't have a lab in the state which can do its own surveillance. So we had to depend upon those labs. It is only our persuasion with them that I think we finally got our data initially of 400 cases and now we have got the nearly 800 cases. So we have been working on it because once in September when we had the first search, we were really concerned about the high mortality. We were worried, is there any kind of a, I mean, this is a UK variant, there can be other variant. That's why I'll advocate, I'll request that we must keep on doing these kind of a sequence of virus because you never know. Uh, some other uh, sort of mutation may come. So I think we need to watch it uh, all the time. If we have to sort of uh, take protective steps right from the beginning to protect, uh, I think the uh, next surges even. So I think we have been uh, looking into this mm -hmm. and uh, this only uh, proves that I think our sample from February, March, they have been showing this high presence of this mutation. We had another 60 sample from January, December. That time there's only one UK variant. 
So I know we have been uh, looking into this. So this is only the. the Okay. Okay. So, uh, and and we, uh, you were there, and Dr. Arora was also part of this conversation we had last week as well, Dr. Arora, and you, uh, you know, referred to uh, the issue of surveillance as well. Um, do you do you believe again, you know, for our uh, view understanding of our viewers, that we need to now significantly step it up and maybe make the turnaround time faster as well? Uh, uh, Tanvi, you are absolutely correct. I think we have to really work harder. I agree with both Shashank and uh, Professor Talwar uh, about this whole issue of uh, variants of concern, as they are called, that they will, they might, they are contributing, and they might be contributing. But I think the whole surge cannot be attributed just to the variants only. Uh, and the other point Sashank raised, which was very important, in the first surge, it was low and middle income uh, uh, groups. And now it is more middle class and upper class. And even the zero epidemiology data showed that the, the vulnerable section is more in the upper class or in the cities who are uh, uh, staying in the urban areas. But urban slums have a highest level of already ex they are exposed. So the number of cases are going to be less. So three things. One is one to, uh, this testing tracking is very important. We cannot attribute everything to the variants of concern. Second, the surveillance has to be picked up and wherever required, we need to do something. Third is uh, the, the whole issue of community engagement and, and let the community really feel that it is not good for either of the things, nor for individual health, nor for family health, nor for the economics of a whole uh, society, because with great difficulty, we are on the upsurge of improvement in the economy. But at this time, again, uh, something like a lockdown is not the answer. So I, I think the leadership has to come back again and get the community uh, into act again. But two things, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Talwar, surveillance issue. Two, second is... Uh, how to see that testing tracking components really becomes as good or as uh, efficient as uh, we have been always trying for that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and just to put this in perspective, as I go back to Dr. Talwar, uh, you know, our research team was trying to compare data to say, July, August, September. Now, the peak months vary for different states. But after we began to lift the restrictions, we, that's when we actually saw the first round of real rise in, in, in cases. Uh, and if you look at Punjab, for example, the uh, you know seven-day moving average uh, of daily cases for Punjab on 3rd of August versus 3rd of March now is roughly the same in the range of 650 to 680. They were on the same page in 3rd of August and 3rd of March. But that seven-day average of daily cases by the end of these very months, in August was 1,435. And in March, we are looking at 2,660. So that's how different it is. Imagine, started off at the same level, but you know, even in August, we didn't see this fast a pace as we are seeing now. And it's not just Punjab. Similar numbers, we, I'll tell, uh, tell you about Maharashtra in just a bit. But Dr. Talwar, I believe, wanted to add something earlier. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, two things more. I think one that uh, we have seen that our positives around uh, 35 to 40 percent were below the age of 30. That also bothered us. And this is what I think UK variant probably is going to infect the younger generation more. And the second aspect is that out of the cases of UK variant, our initial analysis show there is no reinfected case, which means that immunity escape is uh, not there in this world. That is a good thing. And I think samely the vaccine also is also known that it, there's no immune escape, the kind the vaccine that we are using. So I think there are two good things. But uh, younger people, I think that's why when the school colleges were functioning, probably the spread occurred from the younger people more there were, I mean, uh, social events also. So I think let us, I mean, uh, we have to, the COVID protective behavior as, as in one principle which has to be followed. I, I wonder how to impress upon the society that you have a simpler way to protect yourself, but I don't know why, I mean, I'm sure the media has a huge role in this. Thank you.
uh, I hope you know and uh, that it works which is why we repeatedly keep doing these conversations and have you as experts uh, you know to sh uh, uh, help our viewers understand this Dr. Shashank Joshi even in Maharashtra if we see uh, the rate of new infections increasing in the month of August when we were opening up we were beginning to get into that festival mode again was about 51 percent and the same rise rate of rise now is over 300 percent do you agree that the, uh, the second concern there also is that a large percentage of these are also younger people? Absolutely. I would agree with Dr. Talwar and Dr. Arora both. We are seeing a younger population clearly between 20s and 40s. And that's a huge area of concern for us. And we are even seeing children now with, with COVID in across Maharashtra, not just Mumbai, which is, uh, you know, and they are the ones who spread it very quick and fast. So that is our concern. And I think we need to do stronger micro containments so that because lockdown is not at all a solution for this. The solution is a very, very aggressive testing, tracking, and uh, you know, early detection. That's another thing which we are seeing that people think it's a mild flu and you know there is no mortality, so they come very late. And that's another challenge which we are seeing in Maharashtra also and Mumbai also. And I think vaccine, you know, had initially hesitancy, but now you know people are getting it, you know, they need to also be educated on one thing that even after taking one or two doses, you can get infection, but it is asymptomatic or mild. While when you take the vaccine, you will get immunity to save your life or save you from a ventilator or a critical phase. That's very, very important for people to recognize. Because one case, which is an outlier, will occur where uh, somebody with a vaccine single shot after two, three days happened, and then they get it. And also remember, our TPR positive is almost 20%. So, you know, I feel if somebody is going for a vaccination, sometimes I tell them if you can afford it, get a rapid antigen test done and go, then go to take a vaccine. Because we have found many times that they often have the infection harboring with them when they are taking the vaccination. Unfortunately, then vaccination gets a bad name. I would still urge everybody, and also vaccination is therapeutic. So I think everybody should get vaccinated and uh, if you are eligible. And I think we still need to be responsible. I think, you know, I think the responsibility is on the citizens. They can't shirk away from responsibilities. And we need to completely ban all the social gatherings. I think for some time, at least two to four weeks. Because if the social gatherings are going to continue, whether they are religious, political, or otherwise, you know, in public health emergencies, Disaster Management Act is in order. It is absolutely crucial to, you know, avoid these large public gatherings and crowd at any cost. Well, we know we can't uh, ban political gatherings because there are very important elections going on. And uh, I don't think, you know, the government or the election commission are even going to seriously look at it. The last time we asked them, the government said, well, EC has already issued guidelines. They did it, in, uh, you know, for Bihar elections. But every day we get visuals uh, are more crowded uh, uh, than ever before. Uh, this festivals, uh, again, you know, from Kumbh Mela to now Holi, I don't think they, you know, the, the governments are even attempting to tell people to hold back. Back. Beyond this, yes, they want to come and shut down the malls and restaurants at 8 p.m. and believe that that will be the solution to this problem. I don't know. But because two of you experts have raised a very interesting insight, Dr. Rajiv Dasgupta, do you want to come in on this? And, and, and I asked this question about more youngsters, you know, uh, getting prone to the, uh, to, to, to the COVID infection now also, because then it may prompt our government perhaps to relook at our vaccination strategy. It's a younger lot, which is also going out on a daily basis, the working population, which is traveling in public transport, going to offices, interacting more with people, or, you know, going to their businesses, opening shops and factories. So if they are as vulnerable, then do we need to also relook at our vaccination strategy? Well, there are a few interlinked issues. And I go back to what Dr. Talwar was emphasizing. Punjab has been saying all along that the UK variant is important, at least in their case. The point is that India's genome sequencing has actually been relatively less compared to many countries. Uh, the, the Indian consortium of 10 national laboratories was put together only on 25th uh, December 2020, perhaps, I'm just saying perhaps, in advance of the WHO 7 January meeting. So it is only now that we, are, we have actually got our act together of actually having a national consortium of labs. And, and this, this very directly links to what Dr. Dalwar is uh, basically stating, that the states probably were asking for more help than they were getting. That's one. Second, uh, the UK variant spread extremely rapidly in, in approximately 80 days to 46 countries between October and December, early January. And, and that 
to my mind would certainly have a link of why we actually see it rising since February, because till February, this quote-unquote new threat was not there. And the fact that it spreads faster will link naturally to the younger population who are much more mobile and so on. And therefore, even now, the educational institutions are by and large shut, by and large, barring a few states and a few you know, exceptional examples. But the fact is that given India's demography, a very, very large proportion of the working population is indeed so-called young. They, they are not even uh, 45, 50 or 60 plus. And therefore, the vaccination criteria, age was one criteria to protect the most vulnerable. But if the if this limit has to be contained and spread, then obviously this whole uh, whole, whole whole definition of what constitutes a working population will need to be relooked at. So, for example, <clears throat> all 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 kinds of uh, workers are actually frontline. Whether you are in the bank, whether you are a teacher, whether whether you are in the delivery sector, just name it. There are frontline workers and frontline workers and frontline workers. Health and sanitation and the, the policing staff did have a higher probability of risk at that point in time, and therefore the prioritization strategy, which we, we will certainly need to look into. But the catch to this is that even in our original uh, 300 million target, in roughly two and a half months, we have covered about 20%. So which means that the remaining 80% will need to be covered in, uh, in, in, in four months, if that's got to be achieved by July. So there is ultimately a limiting factor on how much the vaccination can be scaled up. And, and that's a reality we need to keep in account. Hmm. Well, we're hoping it does pick up pace starting 1st of April when you know it gets open to everybody above the age of 45 at least. And a lot more people who are willing and were not eligible so far will be able to go. Well, uh, let me actually uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Talwar and Dr. Joshi so much for joining us uh, and sharing their insights with us. And I say good evening also uh, to Dr. Anandwan, researcher with Global Health, Biotechs and Health Policy, and Dr. Pradeep Banandur, additional professor of the Department of Epidemiology in Nimhans, joining us from Bengaluru. Two other states. So we've, we've spoken about Maharashtra, we've spoken about Punjab, uh, uh, two other states that we're looking at, Karnataka uh, and Madhya Pradesh as well. Again, now these are the states that were largely witnessing a uh, higher number of cases even in the first time around and same goes in the second time around as well. But are there any uh, different insights, Dr. Bhan, for example, in a lot of other states we're looking at a rate of infection uh, which is you know, uh, three times or four times more than what we saw in August or September last year. Thanks, Tanvi. So a few things, you know, one, uh, you know, communities um, are important uh, for, for our nation and communities thrive when members of the communities are healthy, right? And uh, this past weekend has been a festive weekend. You had Holi, you had Shabe Bharat, you had Palm Sunday. Um, and, you know, all of us want uh, to have these opportunities to interact with each other. But unfortunately, what's happening, I think, across the nation and even in Madhya Pradesh is that we have a lack of adherence to public health norms. And that, I think, is a big factor in why we are in seeing an increase in number of cases. And that is worrisome because what it will mean is that, uh, you know, the, the doctors, the health professionals are already getting worried. Last year, we did not know as health professionals what we were going to face, um, you know, in, the, in a few weeks' time. But, uh, you know, the experience from last year now, health professionals are aware of that. And I think that's why they are uh, raising an alarm already now. Uh, they see uh, a situation which could be as bad as last year or perhaps even worse if we don't uh, pay attention to the rising number of cases. In Madhya Pradesh, there is still a significant section of the population which is susceptible which doesn't have immunity, which either has not been exposed to infection in the past or has been vaccinated. And uh, many of these are individuals who are in the risk age group. They are older or they have comorbidities, often undiagnosed comorbidities. So uh, that is what worries me as we see more and more infection probably also going into our rural areas with increased social interaction. That is something to extremely be worried about. Our vaccination rates are still low. Um, you know, a lot of people are not coming forward to get vaccinated and uh, this will potentially put us um, in, in uh, the road to 
a lot of uh, you know uh, increase in number of cases and deaths and i think that is what we should all worry about so let, let me ask you this before i take it to our other panelists we've obviously used I mean, we last year we used the lockdown to build up on our healthcare infrastructure and we continued with that as the cases actually increased in um, July, August, and September. A lot of that, uh, you know, temporary infrastructure, in fact, uh, was shut down or taken back uh, as things came under control. Now that we're looking at a similar and perhaps uh, much, much higher number of cases, how far away are we from that healthcare infrastructure emergency? Yeah, so Tanvi, I think on, on, on your show, I've said this uh, maybe a few months ago that, um, you know, there are two aspects to this. One is the infrastructure, which is, you know, building the ICUs and getting the ventilators, but equally important is the human resources. So the ICUs and uh, ventilators were certainly ramped up, maybe not enough, but at least significantly. But what has happened across states, and this is again true of Madhya Pradesh, is that the human resources element has not been paid adequate attention to. In fact, they did short-term contracting often which is to say people were hired for short-term positions, or either contact tracing, whether doing outreach services, but then they were abandoned. You know, there were a lot of frontline health workers who were taken on contract, who protested in front of the chief minister's house of, uh, a few weeks ago, I think. And that just tells us that, you know, if we don't invest in long-term uh, human resources, and we don't build up uh, and ramp up uh, on getting enough uh, health workers out there who can help us with our public health functions, who can help us with running our clinical services, our lab services, our surveillance, our epidemiology functions, then we will always be, uh, you know, put potentially at the risk of knowing too late because we are not able to identify quick enough where the clusters might be and contain them. And that just tells us that, you know, we have obviously doing policy making, which is uh, sometimes having a short term vision. Um, and this is going to impact probably even our vaccination efforts, because if you don't have enough vaccinators, uh, then you will not be able to ramp up enough, even if you involve the private sector. And on top of it, you have to maintain routine uh, vaccination services. So, you, you know, it, it's going to be difficult unless you have adequate human resources. I think the one lesson uh, also for all of us is to remember that uh, all of these services require boots on the ground. We need to invest in them, train them, and sustain them. You know, you don't, you can't just put them on contract in low uh, payment uh, positions and then just abandon them after a few weeks once you see cases going down. You need to think of this from a long-term perspective. We will potentially be facing um, a spate of pandemics over the next few uh, many years. Um, you know, we all have to be prepared for that. But you can't do that uh, by short-term policy thinking. Can, you, you say uh, many years, uh, you know, people are hoping that since the vaccine is already here and the vaccination drive is here, uh, it, the pandemic's already gone. Dr. Ban. Well, this pandemic, this pandemic may go, or it might be converted into an end, uh, uh, you know, an endemic disease. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that, as uh, as a country or as a uh, you know globally as well, that we are not going to be susceptible to other pandemics. You know, okay. given the, all the risk factors which cause this pandemic, another pandemic could be around the corner. You know, we need to be prepared. Hopefully, it will not be, but we need to be prepared. Okay, fair enough. Okay, let me also bring in Dr. Pradeep Banandu. Dr. Pradeep, um, let's talk about the policy reaction and what needs to be done when we are looking at these challenges, healthcare infrastructure, uh, healthcare staff members. Uh, in such a scenario, what are the options with this state? Karnataka didn't, has just about started seeing a big jump in cases, but it can definitely learn the lessons from what Maharashtra is looking at. Yeah, surely. And uh, Karnataka is at kind of an advantage because we have seen the second wave and uh, in other parts of the country, in other states, especially Maharashtra, Kerala and Punjab. And uh, we think that we know the, how the trajectory would be. So already uh, Karnataka, we, are, uh, we have organized uh, uh, community care centers or COVID care centers and uh, we are preparing ourselves for the surge. We are into the second wave and the surge is already on. So in terms of human resources, uh, as of now, the policy is to only utilize the government uh, system and uh, start with it. And uh, But there are talks with the private uh, healthcare institutions also to keep in when there is a need. And there is uh, mapping which is going on with respect to the number of uh, beds available, ventilators available, oxygen supplies, everything. And uh, 
Kormangla Indoor Stadium, 250 bed CCC is now ready. And uh, in case if it is required, the uh, uh, Bangalore uh, International Exhibition Center CCC can also be uh, organized. So that way, there are uh, uh, things which are uh, part of the plan which was done last year and it is being executed in a phased manner. And today with uh, growing cases within Bengaluru, the Commissioner of Bangalore's uh, Managara Palike actually has uh, uh, identified and uh, there is uh, the government has uh, deputed IAS officers for each of the zones of BBMP to take care of COVID management and COVID preventive measures. So that's how we have started. I think uh, with the uh, with what we have seen in Maharashtra and Punjab and Kerala as well, we are kind of ready, but uh, not sure whether we are fully ready. At the same time, we will have to look at uh, improving or intensifying the vaccine drive. Somewhere, somewhere I feel the people are that vaccine hesitancy is still. Uh, uh, there and uh, not sure why even certain anthropologists and sociologists are not sure why this is happening. But uh, I think uh, things will fall in place once for, from first of April when all 45-year-old individuals, irrespective of their comorbidities, are being vaccinated. But uh, as my fellow panelists suggested uh, or mentioned, there might be some dearth of vaccinators within the private setup. We need to improve that and we need to train more vaccinators to combat this second wave surge. Similarly, COVID appropriate behavior amongst community and also getting people getting vaccinated is also as important as the policy decisions or the infrastructure uh, uh, preparedness. Uh, mm -hmm which is uh, there. So it is a balance. So in order to uh, reduce or mitigate the second wave, along with the government, I feel the community or the people need to also be very cautious, one, in following COVID-appropriate behavior, two, in uh, actually getting themselves vaccinated. So I think they need to come in large numbers to the vaccination centers and get themselves vaccinated. Okay, fair, fair, fair enough. So one, of course, speeding up vaccination. Secondly, and this is the important one because this is what is also in our control, which is we ourselves start following the norms, uh, start avoiding these places. You know, I know everybody was COVID fatigued by uh, November, October or November and then went out, you know, uh, in many cases completely berserk uh, socializing. But now that has to be reined in. Uh, Gatherings are being banned on paper. Uh, night curfews are being announced. You know, markets uh, uh, are, are being restricted. But viewers, all of these are actually signals for you to pick up on and, and self-discipline. Because if you don't self-discipline now, a uh, few weeks from now, governments are then going to turn around and say, well, now we have no option. And nobody really goes wants to go down the lockdown road in any which way, but we don't know where it will go if things continue on this path. Dr. Arora, uh, while this will be largely also a state challenge for all of the states, but how do we tackle it? The healthcare infrastructure as well as the healthcare staff, uh, you know, challenge. <clears throat> so I, I've been hearing all our co-panelists and everybody is making two or three very common points giving variable stress and one issue or two issues which are coming up very clear. One is that vaccine uptake, unfortunately, is not at the same pace. And even if all 45 years plus get vaccinated the way we are expecting, see at the moment about 42,000 immunization centers are there. So every day we should have at least about 6 million people getting immunized. But we are hovering between 2.5 to 3 million. And it is gross underutilization of our service. Second is private sector has committed that they will have 20,000 immunization centers. There are only 4,500 or so immunization centers. And I think we request private sector to come up and facilitate this purpose so that some 
uh, manpower uh, uh, issues can be taken care of and the burden uh, shared with the government sector. Third is, I think the community, some nudge strategies have to be brought in. I think one of the most important issue is about using of the mask. Now, what nudge strategy is to be used that young and old and all age groups use it in at all times when they are outside their home? Uh, I think some discussion is required. It is just not a fine issue, but I think some other issue also, maybe if somebody is having, for example, a person without mask in the market, uh, the, the police says, okay, go and stay in certain place for next two hours. So some, some nudge strategy, you know, innovative manner so that there is a behavior change at that level. Third thing is this manpower issue, the way things were ramped up last year, about 60-70% was infrastructure, which was built permanently, and those kind of ramp up at district level and sub-district level, and uh, that was happened. But as Anant has very rightly said, there were a lot of people who were hired and now they have been uh, abundant. Uh, that I think we need to prepare. I, must, I would like to compliment Pradeep here, the way he explained uh, Karnataka is preparing for itself. I think that kind of a micro plan is required for all the states so that as the surge comes, they are able to handle it because we are going to have surge at different areas in different uh, timings. But finally, I think community participation and engagement is very, very critical. Some amount of fear is to be instilled in all of us. The disease is here. See, even if it is uh, variants are contributing to rapid spread. After all, what is the strategy to stop it? Vaccination and COVID behavior. There is nothing else we can do it. So at least these are the two, uh, the four pillars, vaccination, mass, social distance, and hand washing. These four pillars, even if there is one less, the, the chair becomes unstable. So I would request community on one side, but simultaneously a Karnataka-like preparation for facing the surge, uh, these two strategies to be taken. Yes, and, and you know, and I think that for Maharashtra case now is there for all states. For some, it may be a little late because they're also pretty much on the same path already as Maharashtra. But for others, they need to learn these lessons and start bringing in these policies. We've now brought in you know, evening curves, we've stepped up on testing and surveillance uh, and are getting stricter with what the rules which are on paper but were not being implemented. But what do we say about the community? I'm just looking at data that's come in um, from, from the national capital and our reporters actually sent us about all the chalans that the Delhi police um, gave today on the occasion of Holi. Uh, and I'm looking at total 3,282 chalans of without helmet, triple riding, drunk driving, dangerous driving, uh, being almost 50% uh, of it. So, I mean, uh, Delhi registered 1,900 cases in the last 24 hours, but people are more interested in celebrating these festi festivals and getting out and drunk driving on their motorbikes now. So, I think a lot of this will also depend on the states in tougher implementation of the norms. You, you can't just announce this on paper and then let people do what they want on ground. That will have to change. Dr. Ban, very quickly, because you know earlier we were talking about the vaccination policy as well. Do you believe that at least the worst hit areas uh, in our country, districts uh, will should look at a policy where we do targeted vaccination of all kinds of uh, you know, frontline people, workers, uh, those who have to get out every day and do their job? Uh, yes, um, I, I think that's a, that's certainly one of the, uh, you know, options on the table and it should be seriously considered. I think, you know, it has to be one of the responses to try to contain um, areas which are seeing a clustering of cases. That having been said, as Professor Arora very rightly mentioned, you know, it is not one or the other, you know, you, it is one of the options on the table and one of the key uh, facets of a response. It has to be combined uh, with all of the other reinforcement of COVID-appropriate behavior, ramping up of the health system to prepare uh, for a potential rise in the number of cases, and then just smart response at the local level. I think beyond uh, health facility-based vaccination, you know, one of the things to seriously consider uh, is outreach vaccination. You know, I think Kerala has done that with care homes, for example, where a lot of elderly uh, pers uh, persons live, and uh, they've had a fair success in being able to cover 
a significant section of that population which is largely at risk. Every state has to start looking at that potentially as an option. Uh, maybe you might not be able to do it across the state, but at least in areas where you are not getting enough uptake, uh, you know, outreach is certainly something where there is some level of experience with polio, uh, with other routine vaccination programs. So if people are not coming to the um, health centers, then can we go out to them and then try and see if we can increase, uh, at least in the vulnerable age groups, our vaccination numbers. I think that's certainly something to consider. Uh, there should be some uh, local level leadership um, and allowance for that uh, when we have guidance uh, coming in from the center or the state level so that we are able to see innovation and increased coverage um, of, of our vaccines. All right, I'm completely out of time. So I am going to thank all of our panelists for joining us. And I think all of us agree that we cannot emphasize enough on the need for people now to start following the rules. The states need to uh, ensure that the healthcare infrastructure is ready up and about. Um, they, they have, you know, enough of staff members uh, uh, available uh, and well divided between COVID services, vaccination services, as well as non-COVID medical emergencies. Uh, they, uh, civic bodies and police departments really need to ensure that on ground people are following these norms. I mean, the visuals that we got for on account of celebration of uh, Holi uh, are really not the kind of things that you want to be looking at at this point. Just to put it in perspective again, and this is happening nationally and in eight of the worst hit uh, states of our country right now. Viewers, do, we're not even comparing data to what is happening in April or May or June because those were the lockdown days. We were all inside our homes, so the number of cases on a daily basis were far lesser. But then starting June, July, we started lifting the restrictions. People began to come out in smaller numbers and gradually that increased by festival time, you know, between August and November. We saw a large number of people flouting norms everywhere around and that's where a, a, a massive spike in cases took place. We are worse off today in terms of the rate of infection. Maharashtra is already recording much, much higher numbers of cases. The rate of infection is increasing 100, 200, 300 percent times by the week and touching new highs. And soon there will be reports at this pace of not enough beds, not enough ventilators, not enough hospital staff available. All of that really depends on how you and I start conducting ourselves from here on. Think about it. Thank you so much for joining us.